near the ditches this morning. Welcome to Pilgrim Congregational Church. We are glad you are here with us today. Pilgrim is an open, affirming, and actively inclusive community of faith, welcoming all men, women, and children, and grateful for the wholeness of the human community that we experience in diversity of race, marital, marital status, family composition, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, age, and physical or mental challenge. We invite all who are here, all who are here to call into this faith community to participate fully in the life and ministry of the church. We promise to do our best to encounter each person with love, care, and respect. Welcome.
This morning's scripture readings um, are Matthew 4, 12 to 23, and 1 Corinthians 1, 10 to 17. This is from the Common English Bible. Um, Maureen sort of touched on the Corinthians part already. The Matthew um, chapter is about Jesus started his ministry walking along and um, finding his disciples. As I was reading through this, I started thinking, would I be willing to drop what I'm doing and follow this guy? Um, I would say not. <laughs> you know, I was just having a conversation with my son the other day, and he was talking about moving and about you know possibly looking for another job closer to where he'd be moving to. And I remember saying to him, "Don't let go of the bone for the shadow." <laughs> and I felt like in some ways that's what uh, the disciples were doing, and it worked out for them. Now, when Jesus heard that John was arrested. He went to Galilee. He left Nazareth and settled in Capernaum, which lies alongside the sea in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. This fulfilled what Isaiah the prophet said. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali alongside the sea across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who lived in the dark have seen a great light, and a light has come upon those who lived in the region and in the shadow of death. From that time, Jesus began to announce, and change your hearts and lives. Here comes the kingdom of heaven. As Jesus walked alongside the Galilee Sea, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, throwing fishing nets into the sea because they were fishermen. Come, follow me, he said, and I'll show you how to fish for people. Right away, they left their nets and followed him. Continuing on, he saw another set of brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother, John. They were in a boat with Zebedee, their father, repairing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus traveled throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues. He announced the good news of the kingdom and healed every disease and sickness among the people. Second reading. Now I encourage you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Agree with each other and don't be divided into rival groups. Instead, be restored with the same mind and the same purpose. My brothers and sisters, Chloe's people gave me some information about you and you're fighting, that you're fighting with each other. What I mean is this, that each one of you says, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos, I belong to Cephas. I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in Paul's name? Thank God that I didn't baptize any of you except Crispius and Gaius, so that nobody can say that you were baptized in their name. Oh, I baptized the house of Stephanus too. Otherwise, I don't know if I baptize anyone else. Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news. And Christ didn't send me to preach the good news with clever words so that Christ's word cross won't be emptied of its meaning. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are being destroyed, but it is the power of God for those of us who are being saved. A word of God for the people of God. So today I chose two scripture readings, which is a little atypical for us, but don't worry, it does not mean that my sermon will be twice as long. 
Uh, in fact, I'm not going to explore either of them in great depth, although each is rich enough individually to easily uh, inspire two to three sermons. But instead, my focus today is on the links, what links the two passages together, because it strikes me as an important message and a reminder for us as we prepare to begin this next phase of our journey together, led by a new senior pastor. At yesterday's annual meeting, we enthusiastically discussed, thanks to Delina, uh, the formation of a new committee to plan the celebration of Pilgrim's 150th year anniversary in 2024. 150 years. Let that sink in for a minute. Delina helped put that in perspective by noticing that Pilgrim was founded three years before the Great Chicago Fire, one year before the Civil Rights Act was passed, and two years before the telephone, and that's the landline kind, you know, that old-fashioned phone that, that people have. So in other words, it was a very, 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 very long time ago. But more impressive than all the history that we've witnessed was the reflection on how unique it is for a community of faith to have lasted this long. In fact, we're worshiping right now in the oldest continually operating church in Oak Park, which is very cool. Throughout those nearly 150 years, we of course have had our ups and downs, periods when we thrived, and others when we struggled to simply survive. But we made it. And soon we will have the honor and privilege of celebrating 150 years of Christian ministry that has touched the lives of so many, both in our building and in our community and far beyond, through our mission, our outreach, and our prayer. Now, I've personally only been a member of Pilgrim for about 30 years, so I don't have first-hand knowledge of the specifics of how we made it through the first 120. But I'm, I'm guessing that the part of that equation is that as a body, we have been able to maintain an active and focused commitment to doing the hard work of the gospel, doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with God, speaking truth to power, welcoming and building community with those whose conventional wisdom views as outsiders, unworthy, invisible, those who in Jesus' day would have been labeled as unclean. This is the call that Pilgrim has been faithfully and persistently responding to for nearly 150 years. And it's the same call that Peter and his brother Andrew and James with his brother John responded to when Jesus said, follow me. And we're doing it together as a community. As Joycelyn said, if any one of us had been walking by and heard that call, we might have said, mm, maybe after I do a couple things or a little later, or are you talking to me? Maybe that was someone else. But we've done it in community and that's what's been able to make it work. It's a call that is familiar, yet always fresh with new challenges and always relevant. And it's always compelling because each of us in our own way understands, hopes, and believes that the current state of the world is less than perfect and it doesn't have to be this way. This isn't God's wish for creation, and those who agree are called to do something about it. And so we come together as Christ followers to discern what needs to be done, align on how to do it, and put our faith into action, which is where things tend to get a bit more complicated. Because while we're united in our desire to transform our current reality, it is highly likely that we have different ideas about the best way to make that happen. And perhaps even specifically what the desired outcome looks like. These types of differing opinions and preferences have the potential to divide and weaken the church, which is exactly what Paul was concerned was happening in Corinth. 
in some ways, it's reassuring to know that church conflict is as old as the church itself. Scholars aren't exactly sure of the nature of the conflict that Paul is referring to, but it's clear that he is concerned that the good people of the church have begun to draw their identity from something other than the gospel. They are prioritizing their identity and relationship with the leader who brought them to the church over their identity and relationship with Christ, the reason for the church. Paul had received word that there were some attitudinal divisions and bickering amongst the converse of the congregation. And the source of these disagreements was likely the sorts of common, everyday things that come up when working in community. Some scholars have even suggested, based on the translations, that there were, might be sort of petty, perhaps caused by jealousy or frustration and for failure to get one's way. <clears throat> at any rate, we know that at this point they weren't full-scale divisions or more serious theological differences, but small disagreements can grow into permanent divisions, which is what Paul wanted to prevent. There were some members who claimed Paul as the authority concerning the way we do things around here because he was their founding member. Even though he had moved across the Aegean and was carrying out his apostolic work in Ephesus now. There were others who preferred to reference the teachings of Apollos for guidance. He was the minister who had been there most recently, and from their perspective, his strong intellect powerful sermons and command of the scriptures validated the source of his authority. Still others gave priority to the teachings of Cephas or Peter as the authority because he was one of the original apostles. Paul appears to find these split loyalties both concerning and frustrating and fairly aggressively urges them to stop focusing on what divides them and instead focus on what unites them. Their desire to follow Christ in the work, doing the work needed to create a just and peaceful world for all. But Paul's call for unity should not be interpreted as a call for uniformity. The remainder of 1 Corinthians, make, Corinthians makes abundantly clear that Paul doesn't believe that all believers must have identical views on all things or that they must walk in lockstep which is awesome because, as you can see from the Fry exercise, that is not going to work at Pilgrim. <laughs> Luckily, it's not the way of the UCC either. One of our denomination's mottos is, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, diversity, in all things, charity. The unity that we seek requires neither an uncritical acceptance of any point of view, nor rigid formulation of doctrine. Unity in faith does not mean uniformity in thought and practice. Given that we at Pilgrim want and honor diversity of all types, in demographics, in personal experience, skills and interests, in thought and practice and expressions of faith, I want to close by spending a moment reflecting on the last part of that phrase, in all things charity. Like the church at Corinth, at Pilgrim, we are blessed to have many passionate members with strong points of view. <laughs> and although we might not see ourselves aligning ourselves specifically with this pastor or that pastor or that leader, we definitely have a wealth of ideas and enthusiasm concerning things we'd like to start doing, stop doing, keep doing with a little tweak. <laughs> Plus, we have our don't change this or we won't be the pilgrim anymore sacred cows. <laughs> Creative energy is the fuel that will help us to maintain the relevancy and effectiveness of our ministry for the next 150 years so that is indeed a blessing, and it is also important to remember and honor the essence of who we are as a community. What made us want to return after our first visit? What keeps us coming back, in some cases year after year? So one of our challenges going forward will be to hold 
these two forces in healthy tension. During our two years of transition between settled pastors, we have graciously and bravely explored many new things with Pastor Michelle and me. And in some measure, our openness to experimentation has benefited from the fact that this has been called out as a clear time of transition, a safe environment to try things because it's temporary. For some of us, it's relatively easy to be tolerant or even supportive of a new idea if we don't think it's going to become a permanent fixture. It can be much more difficult if our thinking is something along the lines of, this is my window of opportunity to influence the status quo for the next 150 years, <laughs> to create a new tradition. And while I know that sounds very ridiculous, I'm guessing that some of us have experienced that when the new pastor gets here, we'll blank, fill in the blank feeling. And I'm willing to bet that we don't all want to fill in the blank exactly the same way, which is great because there's strength in our unity and our diversity as long as there's charity in both. In situations of church conflict, whether it's over some time, something that seems very trivial or something that is clearly significant, being right is never good enough if there is no love. Being right is never good enough if there is no love. Because although we pursue many of the same goals as other social justice and charitable organizations, as a church, we are unique in that we are grounded in God. And all that we do is grounded in God's unconditional and unwavering love for us. God calls us out of our comfort zone to be the church, to be a blessing to those in need and co-creators of a more just and sustainable world, to open our lives to a radical renewal that may upset and reorient our patterns of comfort and familiarity, our unquestioned assumptions, perhaps even the privilege we enjoy without being aware of it. May we continue as a beloved and loving community to urgently respond to God's call as the body of Christ, united in all that is essential while honoring diversity in all that is non-essential. Amen. Amen. We each have been called and have answered that call in our own unique way, which doesn't mean it's easy. What makes it easier, what makes it even possible, is that we do it in community. So as you go about your week answering the call in the way that is most comfortable and familiar to you, know that you are blessed, you don't go alone. Pilgrim is with you, and God journeys with you. Peace be with you.